Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Bill of Rights Institute's 10th period. Uh, I'm Kirk Higgins. I'm the Senior Manager for Education at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I'm joined this week by my colleagues Gary and Rachel. Hi, good to see you. So this week, last week we talked about, I guess it was two weeks ago, we talked about uh, America in crises. Um, and since that point, the crises has unfortunately continued um, and gotten worse. Um, and, and we're all dealing with that. We're all still at our homes um, because of the COVID-19 situation. And, um, and, and we've been sort of working um, at observing a lot of what's been going on. Um, and as part of sort of observing and thinking about how it is that we can incorporate a lot of the lessons that we're seeing unfolding, we thought it'd be a good chance to take a step back um, and look at sort of the foundational philosophy behind our government, which ordinarily wouldn't be that exciting, but I happen to be really passionate about the Federalist Papers and oh, Gary and Rachel. I think, I think you underestimate our audience. I, <laughs> maybe with this audience, it might always be exciting to talk about the origins of the right. American right. family. People, people do ping us a lot about it. <laughs> we true. are the Bill of Rights Institute. Right, that's right, right. That's right. That's and this right. really is the moment, right? I mean, we've right. talked among ourselves that, you know, right now you really get to see all the different levels of, of governance, of, of interactions in society. I, I don't think I've ever seen more uh, news about states and decisions that are being made in per state uh, in a very, very long time, if ever. Well, and, and I think I think it's so crisis driven. Usually, like you'll you'll hear about a state governor, like if there's a major catastrophe or something, but it's one off. It's not right. all the different governors of all the different states constantly in front of the cameras talking about what their state is doing and how they're joining or not joining other states. Right. Yeah, that's right. And I think again, sort of thinking about it from a from a foundational kind of point of view, I think it's interesting at this moment because the lessons are very close, right? And for students, a lot of times, we're thinking about abstract concepts of other crises that have happened a long time ago. Um, and although it's unfortunate, there are a lot of examples right now that you can kind of sink your teeth into. And so whether or not we dive into, you're able to dive into with your students now, some of these lessons with the Federalist Papers, we think over the next year, two years, few years, um, kind of taking a fresh look at the Federalist paper and Papers and drawing out some of these lessons could be a really enriching activity uh, uh, to do with your students. And so with that, we'd start, I guess, with just a little bit of an intro about the papers, um, and then the ones we're going to walk through today. So I've picked a selection of them, um, not at random, but sort of at random. Um, but what we tried to do here is uh, both look at sort of an overall view of what the project of the Federalist Papers was, because it was a complete project, even though they were published sequentially um, as individual papers, um, but then also to tie them into news events that we thought you know, brought out some of the themes of these papers. Um, and in particular, the Bill of Rights Institute, we've been talking a lot about um, the presidency and the constitution lately. So we're doing a little bit of an emphasis on the executive branch and um, looking particularly at, um, at, at the powers of the executive, um, partly too, because the way executive agencies work now, obviously the, they're in the news a lot. So things like um, the CDC, um, and um, even FEMA, in some cases, uh, are really in the news, and those are all part of the executive branch. Um, and so it's, it, it's interesting to look at the papers um, from that point of view, too, with those in mind. So sort of with that, um, Gary and I were chatting the other day, um, and it occurred to me to sort of lay out the overall plan um, of the papers. And it, 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 I don't think it was the first time that Gary had heard it, but it was at least something that was a little bit novel um, and interesting to step through. So I thought I would kind of talk about what, what Madison Jay and Hamilton were doing um, in 1787 and 1788 and why it is that they wrote 85 of these things. Um, why couldn't they have just done it in like two or three? Uh, but, but overall, the approach obviously these are taking place during the ratifying conventions. So each state was called um, to ratify the constitution. The constitution stipulated that there had to be nine of the 13 states that ratified. Um, and in one of the most biggest states so they, that they needed to get over the hump of ratifying the Constitution was New York. And New York also happened to be um, very contentious. There was a lot of um, anti-federalist uh, support there. And so there was concerns that New York might be on the fence of a ratification. And so Hamilton, Madison, and Jay got together, the John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, to write these 85 papers. Um, and the way they did it is really interesting. So they start off, and we'll dive in the first Federalist here in a second, but they start off with this sort of invitation to the people of the United States, not just of New York, although that's where it was published, but to the people to decide how it is, um, how it is that they would go about ratifying this convention. 
Uh, and, and so then they go immediately from there into talking about the union. So not only do we want to have this new constitution that's being put forward to you, but it's important that we preserve this union of states. Um, and then from there, they begin to talk about, well, the re reason we need to preserve that union are all these benefits. Oh, and by the way, the Articles of Confederation, which this constitution is replacing, weren't holding up that union. And these are the dangers that, could, should, that would come from that. Um, that then necessitates new powers to this constitution. So then they step through what those powers are um, in the several papers. And then move from there into justifying how those powers work in concert together to continue to preserve uh, this system and this union, which they've now justified. Um, from there, they go into more of those particulars, some checks and balances. And then finally, they step through each of the branches. So they look at the legislative branch, both House and Senate, then the executive branch, the judicial branch, and then they wrap up um, in the last couple of Federalist Papers with some loose ends, as I like to call it. Uh, most famously in Federalist 84 is Hamilton's rejection, amongst other things, um, of the need for a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. So there is a plan to it. I think oftentimes we'll hop around and we'll dive into Federalist 10 or 51 because they've got some really juicy bits and we're going to dive into both of those. Uh, but looking at the overall plan makes it really interesting to see how it is that Hamilton and Madison, who wrote the majority of the papers, really conceived of this and what they thought they had created um, in the Constitutional Convention. So with that, I think we can dive into the first Federalist paper. Yeah. Absolutely. And so there is a copy of the readings that um, we're going to put in the comments and then also link to on our website. So you can follow along with our page numbers and, and it's all referenced. And then we're also going to show you some of the some of the excerpts on the screen here so you can follow along that way. So you'll have, you'll have both of them. So if you can't quite read what's on the screen, you can also dive into the, the PDF that we'll link to. Yeah. And can I follow up? I think it's really interesting. Um, you're right. Looking back on it, often people will seek out elements of it. But, but there's something so striking about the idea that there had to be a logic in the way that it was published uh, and put out there. How do you recommend someone read the Federalist Papers? Well, if everybody could read it start to finish, that would be great. Um, All of them. <laughs> All, but all I, think, I think it's good, especially for students, if you can get a few selections from sort of those different passages, you get a really good picture for the entirety of, of, the, of the project that they were undertaking. I think one of the things that often happens when you only select a few papers here and there is you get sort of this uh, mechanical feeling for the Constitution. Um, and in Thoreau's 51, we'll talk a little bit about the auxiliary precautions that, that um, are in the Constitution to protect, um, the, the, to keep the government on track, basically. Uh, but those auxiliary precautions aren't enough. And I think what, what Madison really brings out a lot, and Hamilton um, a, a good bit as well, is the, the human element that's at work here. And in looking at different selections of the Federalists, starting with one, I think is really important. Um, but then even looking at a few that we're not going to touch on, like 37, um, and even all the way up to 84, um, but looking at a few of them that color how it is that the logic of what those other pieces were building in the Constitution and what's required of, as, of us as individuals really gives a complete picture. Um, but I think, I think there's no harm either in just looking at, one, at 10 and 51. I mean, they're, they're, they're the, the staples for a reason, and they're really powerful, and they sum up some really amazing arguments uh, and, and are well worth diving into with your students if you have the opportunity. Right. And so looking at the first Federalist Paper here, uh, you know, I call this the invitation. Um, and it's important, too, to note that at the beginning of all of these, um, each paper says, to the citizens of the state of New York, right? So it's emboldened right there. It's not to the legislature. And it's not to um, certain individuals or to, um, even as you might see during the American Revolution, to King George, right? Um, so it's not to the governor of New York, who does get a bad rap. Gary and I were joking about that before, uh, beforehand, too, that, that the governor of New York really gets a... Gets a called out in the papers yeah. but but to the as a new yorker it's a it's it's noteworthy that you know this is where these conversations are happening and, and everything like that and it's an interesting part of the per persuasiveness and the the attention that i think is is noteworthy yeah absolutely yeah i always i always thought that that recognizing the the position that new york held in the federalist in in the federalist debate was always uh, again, I'm from New Jersey, so uh, biases, but it, it was that there are, there even at that time, there was such a diversity of opinion that you had to be really careful with how you uh, conveyed your arguments and with the rhetoric that you were using because you had, you know, old families that had been there for generations and you had new immigrant families and you had commerce and you had the farmers. And so New York has always been in kind of, 
this, it has been this incredibly, this place of incredible diverse opinion. Um, and so, so doing things in New York will, will, or, or arranging your arguments to, to, uh, to appeal to New Yorkers is a particular kind of thing where you can test out lots of different ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, these papers, although they were published in newspapers in New York, were being sent to all the different states um, in order to shore up uh, their own ratification conventions, ratifying conventions. Most, most notably, um, Hamilton was sending these papers directly to George Washington um, and saying, hey, use these in Virginia as you're going through your ratification um, debates because they're going to be really, uh, the, the, um, they, they really summarize things well. Um, and so, it, yeah, and in this first Federalist, you get sort of a flavor for what's going to come further on down, but also an underlining of the preamble of the Constitution, which says, we the people. Um, but my favorite line um, from this, and probably the most famous one, um, is down there, uh, sort of in the middle of the paragraph, but it says, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country to decide by their conduct and example the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. So as a historical moment, this is really powerful because this is you know, one of the first rare instances of a country coming together to decide how it is going to be governed. Right. Um, and, and it's a conversation amongst those people, or at least those who were qualified to participate um, with property qualifications. And also there was restrictions on on who was allowed to participate in government. But the, of those people who are participating, they're being called upon to deliberate and decide through their representatives whether or not this system um, is going to rule over them and they're going to make this pivot or not, um, which I think is really remarkable. Uh, and, and just down underneath that, you then get a sense for what part part of that means. And I think this second paragraph is is really interesting, and I included it um, just because I think it's reflective of uh, democracy throughout time. Um, but it's basically Hamilton's, or I should say Publius, they all wrote under the same pseudonym, and that was deliberate, uh, so that not one person would be assigned to their motivations. Um, and also, uh, as Rachel was mentioning, a good rhetorical flourish, too, as it's referring back to um, a, a, a Roman uh, a historical figure who they were trying to evoke um, in their writing. Um, but he basically just goes on this screed about how everybody else that talks to you except us is going to man be manipulating you. Don't listen to them. They're going to be really loud and they're going to say that we're doing this for bad reasons, but we're not. In fact, they're doing it for bad reasons and we need this new energetic government in order to prevent them from stealing your rights, which we're certainly not going to do. Um, and Hamilton has this really flowery language in the way he goes through that. But I think it's really interesting that, look, we're going to decide. And by the way, the reason that it's hard for those people to do that is exactly what Hamilton's doing right here. It's because people assign different motivations. There is no outside governing structure or no hierarchical structure that's determining for you how things are going to go. It's about us coming together as human beings and deliberating. And that act of deliberation is really difficult to do. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there are lots of different ways to approach putting documents in front of students, right? There are, there's, there's pedagogical tools, there's Socratic tools, there, there are all these different things to do. I find that that section right in the middle there and in, starting with an enlightened zeal for the energy and efficiency of, gov of government will be this section, this argument down to the end of the paragraph, you could spend, I can easily, so I taught mostly middle school, um, mostly eighth and ninth grade, I could spend an hour with my students just understanding what the argument here is and asking them whether or not it's true, right? Do you agree with Publius that it is it like this the the zeal for energy and efficiency um what do you agree with? Do you agree that a zeal for energy efficiency is a path to despotism? Do you agree with so once they understand this, then asking, like, is this true is a whole other level of questioning. Um, and I think that there's, this is what I love about the Federalist Papers and why it's like kind of tragic that we don't, in, especially in the Jet Ed classes, don't get, enough, don't get much time to spend with these documents um, because there's so, there's so much richness in so much of the language, but it takes so much time to pull it out for the kids.
I think it's really interesting how you're sort of setting up that it's a it's an interesting opportunity for students to begin to grasp the idea of what we often refer to as like meta writing, right? Or metacognition. This idea that he starts off not with like, here's the government idea, I'm trying to sell it to you, but rather here's the logic behind it. Do you see even the idea of conceiving of government itself is something I need to walk us through right. a little bit or, or to discuss. Like the idea of logic and as you said on the earlier page, almost this idea that you know, we have an opportunity to create something that comes from, and I'll throw out the word prudent, um, prudence and reason. Um, but if, if this doesn't work, not only does the government we're building not work, but what about even our ability to design something within reason? Does it have to be organic? And I think this whole section, as you were just saying, Rachel, is very much like that. Like we can even contemplate the task at hand yeah. in an interesting way. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, I mean, even even dealing in, in energy and efficiency and what Hamilton's talking about there is really powerful, right? Because he's, he's really talking about latitude um, and then the ability to act on that and throughout the Federalist Papers what they're what what they're inevitably arguing for is a government of limited ends meaning limited goals but unlimited means to achieve those goals so for those discrete purposes they want to have a government that's as energetic as it needs to be to accomplish those ends um, and it's up to us as people to determine whether those are the right ends or not um, and and I really like what both of you said there, because I think what, what Publius is ultimately doing here is teaching us about the, the, the government that we have. Um, and I think him acting in the role as teacher here is actually really interesting because he's, he's trying to rhetorically walk through the people of the United States, this complex thing that they've poured a lot of thought into um, and, and that it's going to be ultimately arguing that it's going to be beneficial for them. Um, and so then jumping down, you know, we're talking about setting up this grand plan, going to Federalist 10, which again is one of the most famous um, ones, but I think there's another sentence here that that can really be chewed on um, by students for, for a long time. Um, and I think we included a good bit here, um, and the Bill of Rights Institute actually has these really great um, annotated versions of, of several of these, which we've linked um, on the documents. Um, and, and that have are annotated and also they're just excerpts. So a little bit smaller than the full paper, which makes it a lot more approachable um, in some ways. But, but my favorite line in, in Federalist 10, and it's one that I've really been thinking about um, a lot lately, especially as um, you know, there, there's been a lot of um, conversations about um, uh, uh, the role of government in faction and everything else. Um, and we might be missing Federalist 10. Are, are we on our slideshow? That's we okay. Are missing, we are missing Federalist 10. Well, I'll throw, okay. it, I'll throw it out there anyway. But the line yeah. is um, that it could never be um, more truly said um, than of the first remedy that it is uh, worse, that the remedy is worse than the disease. And then he goes on to say, liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an ailment, an ailment without which it instantly expires, but it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. Um, so although it's a little bit harder to follow along um, on that uh, without, the, without the document in front of us, um, that, that line always just stands out to me because it, it is, the diversity too that Rachel was just talking about, like there's something inherent within us as diverse human beings in every sense of the word. We all have diverse opinions and views on everything from politics to cooking to religion to what television shows we're watching while we're all in isolation. That in and of itself means that we're going to have disagreements inevitably. And so what Madison is outlining in 10 Federalists is less that there is no, uh, that, that there is an avoiding of that sort of natural tension, which will come about, um, but it's more controlling what effects that faction is able to have. So we're going to disagree, but how can we channel that disagreement in a way that is going to be effective and in, in, in positive and overall trend toward the common good as opposed to our own individual um, wants, needs, and desires? Yeah, I don't know if I can react to that, but that was that was really that one always really struck me because you often hear the term human nature and people posit, well, this is human nature or that's human nature. I think that part of Federalist 10 is so 
clearly, even making the analogy of nature with fire and water and things like this, right? It's, it's right in to say like, this, this thing, the factions is, is going to happen. So there are a couple of choices. You could either extinguish it somehow, or you can allow something and it, which becomes, I would say, would you say it's a quality, but right, that there's this the way to deal with it in some ways, a really much more powerful way to put it, to say like, we're not gonna design a way that there isn't, you know, disagreement or at least diversity of thought, but rather what do we do about it? And I think that was a really interesting approach to incorporating human nature in a, in a powerful way that we didn't need to be sell, sold on the concept. Yeah. I found out what happened and that was my fault. I put together the slideshow. I didn't change the header. So Federalist 10 is here. It's just only by line number, not by header. Oh, so. Well, no problem. Uh, but we can touch on just really quickly because I did see the uh, one uh, news article that we had included in here. Um, which is one just ripped straight out of the headline recently. Um, and I think uh, it's just uh, it had a picture of Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi, uh, Pelosi, Pelosi forms Pelosi the new forms select committee. Right. And so, um, again, not needing to get political, but just thinking about the idea that, look, this is, this is faction and faction isn't inherently bad. It's there are different people who are looking at things from different perspectives. And the idea that there is now $2 trillion going out into the economy means that there's different people in our government that want to oversee that. And so this is a way that our government is allowing for different factions and perspectives to function together in a way that is ultimately healthy, even though a lot of what we see is sort of the, the difficult work of government, because government is, especially popular government, is, is extremely difficult. Uh, we had mentioned efficiency before, uh, and, it's, and it is efficient. Uh, well, it's not efficient, right? And that can be frustrating to us, um, but it can be efficient when it needs to be. And so our government acted really quickly, um, relatively speaking, when, this, when the pandemic was emerging, um, which is interesting again to talk about what that efficiency means. Uh, but now we're getting to a point where we, we want to say, okay, well, how are we all going to watch over the, the, this, very, this immense amount of money um, going into, the, into, into our communities and into our society. Um, and so this is a, just one example. We couldn't have pulled many others, but this is just one example of, of showing this paper sort of in action. Yeah. I mean, I, this is a close reading, so if I could jump in with a tiny little thing. I thought it sure. very striking. One word that appeared in this right there in, in, in the top there and in Federalist 10, which is, if you see, it's a little tough to see, but it says, where there's money, there's also frequently mischief. And Publius mentions the same word, mischief, in Federalist 10. And I thought, it's such a specific word about what happens with large groups of people and decisions being, being made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and, those, and, and faction can lead to mischief. Faction can lead to bad things. Faction can also lead to really good things. Uh, it's just not inherently one thing or the other. And so, we, you know, the Federalists at least are arguing in the papers that we're setting up a system that tries to control the effects of what that faction is doing to try and orient it towards uh, good outcomes. Hmm. And so one of the ways it does that is in Federalist 39. Um, and I'll step through this quickly. If you wanna know more about Federalist 39, uh, we have a new series out called Bright and Early, uh, where Rachel, Gary, and I actually just had a really rich conversation specifically about Federalist 39 and in different ways that um, we've been interacting with it. But Federalist 39 is great um, in that it's, it's Publius going through how our federal system works. In federalism, is this strange concept uh, that's sort of, I mean, it's, it's hard to understand sometimes for us to know what level of government we need to turn to for what and what's able to do what, um, particularly during the pandemic, as we were mentioning before, we're, we're hearing more about state governors and more about uh, state legislatures and, and even city and town rules than we ever have before, it seems like. Uh, and so this is very much on the front of the mind. And what he's doing here is, so he's talked through sort of the need for union, the, the, why it is that the government needs the powers and energy that it has. Um, and now he's really defending and saying, look, you know, a core part of what our government needs to be is Republican, because we've determined that this is the best mode of government that we can possibly have. All the state, all the 13 states had Republican governments of some variety. Uh, and here he's defending the new constitution as creating a Republican government, but then also going into how it's both national and federal, meaning it's the whole country, but it's also the individual state governments are still protecting those. Um, and then he steps through the different um, arguments and ways that the structure of the government 
um, and not only the structure, but where it derives its power from um, are rooted in both of those things. I found this, this first paragraph that we excerpt here to be really powerful, um, again, rhetorically, but also this kind of exhortation to each individual to be self-governed. That's a, a term we talk about a lot at the Bill of Rights Institute, self-governed and self-government, but he calls on the genius of the people of America, which, you know, I think that, so you mentioned our, our, our um, series Bright and Early, which is a new web series that we've developed for students. So if you're looking for a, you know, 15 to 25 minute chunk of time to drop into a LMS or one of your classrooms, please go to our YouTube channel. We have that up. Um, we have three episodes out now. We do them every Tuesday and we launch them every Tuesday and Thursday talking about current events and just getting our take and, and what, what students can do um, in response to those current events uh, in their homes and in their communities. But this idea of the genius of the American people, what, what's reconcilable with that? What is the fundamental genius um, of, the American, of the people of America that he's referring to? And then also this idea of the honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom to rest all of our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. And so I think there's a lot of questions right now in the news about mankind's capacity for self-government, right? That's what a lot of these questions about federalism in the news, um, about how the different agencies are making recommendations and then how the states and jurisdictions are taking the recommendations and, imp and implementing them or imposing them. Um, you know, there are certain communities which feel very much like they should be able to make their own decisions and be self-governed in particular ways. And there are other communities that feel that self-government means that we collectively make decisions for all of us. And that is what self-government is. It's not an individual governance, but a collective governance. And so I think there's, there's a lot, again, to dissect in just these couple of sentences at the beginning of 39. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that's the fun of close readings like this is, you know, just going back and kind of, let me look at one sentence, you know, that e each one is really so rich. I mean, I'm looking at the, the second uh, section here, the second paragraph here, you know, and, and even after years of teaching, you know, and trying to pose things certain ways, you know, students' concepts of of groups and 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 dissectiveness in this like the idea of federal government for my students often was this external thing that was somewhere else you know oh you're talking about the federal government those are the people who live in that area and they worry about these things but really having the word confederacy and this idea of 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 unity in a way you know not unity being the same but unity and being connected uh is a really interesting part that you can keep seeing it, but then even rereading it over. And it's like, yeah, it's a different mental image of what government is, uh, much like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to kind of tie this into what we were just talking about, um, in the next paragraph down, um, he says, you know, first, in order to ascertain the real character of the government, it may be considered in relation to the foundation on which it is established to the sources from which its ordinary powers are to be drawn, and to the operation of those powers to the extent of them, and to the authority by which future changes in the government are to be introduced. So again, he's using his logic to lie out, lay out his argument, but then he's immediately talking about, look, we've called ratifying conventions where the people of the state have determined how those ratifying conventions will be formed, and how it is that they'll vote to approve or not approve this constitution. So he's really saying, look, it's really both and here. He, he's, he's calling on um, us as individual citizens to create that other thing that's going to exist outside of them and not necessarily rule directly over them because their immediate representatives in the states will in many instances, but that it still has that overall sort of larger umbrella that is going to unify us, keep us together and work toward, again, these limited ends that the national government has been designated. Um, and so here again, Publius is being really careful to keep exactly to what, what you both were highlighting, which is this genius for the American people to have self-governance um, and using that to justify that, look, we're not consolidating here. This isn't one big national government. We're preserving the system that allows you to have as much of a voice as individuals and as states as possible within the plan. So, um, and then we, we also uh, featured another current event here, uh, just touch on it really quickly. Um, the Bill of Rights Institute's actually been doing a lot on federalism lately, uh, but this one article 
um, kind of stood out. It's really interesting. Um, if you're interested in checking it out, we also did an e-lesson um, a couple uh, weeks ago, I think already, talking about federalism um, and, and just how it is that, again, individual states are responding um, and how, the, how our system is allowing for that to happen. And I think after this crisis is over with, I think there's going to be a lot of questions about whether or not that balance of power was done correctly. Should the federal government have done more? Should it have done less? Um, was, it, was it the appropriate level of intervention? Um, I think all of those kinds of conversations are going to come about. So it'll be really interesting to dive back into these and look at these, um, these articles that are being written in the midst of crisis, I think, a little bit further down the road. Mm -hmm. So then jumping into Federalist 51, so again, we seem to be going all over the place, right? But 51 is interesting because we're, this is on the edge of where he starts diving into each of the individual branches. So we've now set up the system. We know what powers it has. Um, everything's great. Um, and now we're going to dive into exactly what it is that functions within government, how it is that the distinct powers are separated, and how they check and balance one another. Um, and I love this opening line because he says, to what expedient then shall we finally resort for maintaining in practice the necessary partition of power among the several departments as laid down in the Constitution? In other words, we've got this great system. How in the world are we going to keep it so that it's confined <laughs> to what it needs to be doing? Um, and then moving on um, in the second paragraph, which is a little bit more lengthy, um, but this is where uh, the famous line of ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Um, but going back to something Gary touched on earlier, um, and I think Rachel touched on too, talking about the, the, the human nature element that's in these, um, I think is, is really interesting. He says, the interest of man must contend or must be connected with the constitutional rights of place. It may be a reflection of human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is the government itself but the greatest reflection, the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, again, another famous line, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls of government would be necessary. A lot of times people stop there. I love going on to the next sentence um, because I think it's, it's really fun to go through with students. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and then the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control of the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. Auxiliary precautions. And that's, I mean, that, that to me is where we're, the, the tension right now, right? So what is the, what are the limits? What is yeah. the control that yeah. government can have over our lives? And what are the controls that we have over government, even in the midst of something as dramatic as, as the epidemic we're, we're going through right now? Yeah. Yeah. And why is it that we hamstring government? Right? Why, why is it that we don't want this just incredibly efficient government that can do whatever we say that we want it to do? Right. Because we could, we could, you could create that. But and there are, and we see examples of that. And one of the things I love about this, again, thinking about the Federalist Papers in the current context, is, you know, many, many commentators and students maybe are seeing the way that other countries are responding to this crisis and then saying, oh, America's so inefficient in how we're responding. Right. And lamenting the hamstringing. Right. It has to go through this huge process in Congress or like the states have to appeal to the CDC or they have to. There are all these layers of complexity that are that are hamstringing our opportunities um, to, to, to act in the way that we feel best for our for our community. Um, and I think that this is the, again thinking about just right now having students ask the question you know, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control in the government, but experience what, like, what are the necessary precautions? What are the risks? What are the, what are the dangers? Um, and how do we, how do we think about balancing liberty and security? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's this really interesting, if you could, if I could draw an image, I don't have a telestrator, but it's this really interesting thing of like, so they, a what? They Wait, a what? A telestrator, isn't that a thing where you can like, you know, no? I think you may have dreamed that, but it's a great word for it. I don't oh. know what that word is, cool. but it's a fabulous word. Well, excellent. We'll add it to the glossary terms. But, um, <laughs> but it's this idea that the people are controlling the government, right. and the government's controlling the people, and then the government also has to control itself, and the people have to control the government still. Right. So there's this weird circular right. thing. Quadrant. And again, 
Yeah, and all of that, again, is rooted, which he does here really well, lays out logically. It's rooted in this understanding of human nature that look, human beings are great. They're capable of incredible things. They're also capable of not incredible things and of really challenging things. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it creates this interesting nexus, right, that, that does become inefficient and challenging um, and, and so difficult to kind of work through. But I think it's, it poses a lot of interesting questions that you can raise with your students and have some really rich discussions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and even, I mean, you can have an entire discussion just on the word control, right? So there's, I'm thinking in terms of how, uh, at least where, where we are, but, but even just kind of nationally, there's, you know, what I, what I can do in this context right now, but then what my neighbor does is also really important to what I'm doing, but I can't, can I make my neighbor do something? Can anybody make people do things right now? We can recommend. Um, and yet there's this sort of collective, you know, walking, walking through the logic of if, if people do this, maybe this is best and we're figuring it out collectively um, in a really powerful way that, that hopefully is really helping. You know, I, I think that happens. A lot of us are making decisions long before official air quotes, recommendations were happening, um, and even afterwards, but it's not because of those things. It's, we are saying, what, what, what can I do? What can neighbors do? What can everyone do? And it's, it, it, it happens almost silently, but it isn't silent, right? It's all a big discussion. So, so that whole idea of like, what is human nature and what is control and what is responsibility and what are rights all are wrapped up in this one thing. You yeah, know, absolutely. Little little thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> All the capital letter words. All the yeah. capital letter words. <laughs> so, but speaking about efficiency in government, the one place where government is most efficient is the executive branch, right? So if we dive into that, um, I think it's particularly interesting just because, again, of the of the, 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 the current crisis that we're going through, we're seeing a lot of executive agencies, um, we're seeing a lot of executives, whether the president or governors, um, they're very much present now. Um, and so I, I took a, a very brief selections from several of the papers that deal with the executive, which is 67 through about 71, um, where they're really, again, laying out um, these titles. I think it's funny too, by the way, if you actually go through the papers sequentially, you start understanding the titles more, which are often very odd. It's like, uh, you know, the, the exec, the powers of the executive further explored and explained. It's like, well, what further explored? And what's he even talking about? So, um, so anyway, in all this the first spare one time right now, everyone, and all the spare time we have, no one has, right. 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 We're all well, hearing yeah, is I, just I, go straight through in order. Got it. No yeah. Problem. I, I I would say that that's a very overwhelming experience, but if yeah. you are more than welcome to, if you would like to, so. And Kirk would be uh, happy to hear if you want to comment on our Facebook page. He'd love <laughs> to hear your experience. If you want to live stream it, Kirk would, I'm sure, be yeah. overjoyed to have someone else to yeah. talk to who has read the Federalist yes. Papers cover to cover. <laughs> yeah, my wife gets very depressed when I just keep <laughs> quoting the Federalist Papers to her. With, but uh, anyway. Um, so I, I included this first one again, just as a reference back to um, the first Federalist Paper again, because here uh, again you have uh, Publius writing against this unknown other who is now um, who is working to misrepresent what they were trying to do with the executive. Um, keeping in mind too, obviously the executive was a very touchy subject. The Articles of Confederation did have a president. Um, he didn't have a lot of power. He was very much a figurehead and sort of was a part of the legislative branch. wasn't a distinct um, group or a distinct branch, um, and so he wasn't really effective, and so they've now created this other branch. Um, but keeping in mind that the, many of the framers, their biggest concern was legislative over overreach as much as uh, executive overreach. So although they're concerned about the executive, they were really concerned about the legislature, but the executive was also uh, something they were concerned about. So he talks about the misrepresentations again, um, and, and I just like, again, connecting it to the way that we're hearing partisan news now, or, or the fact that, you know, we get just inundated with information that the way that it's presented isn't anything new. I think it's just fun to connect that back for students. Um, and so I love his line, nor have I scrupled in so, uh, in so flagrant a case to allow myself the severity of an ad, oh, that's a tough one, uh, an 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 of version? Little congenial with the general spirit of these papers. I hesitate not to submit um, it to the decision of any candid and honest adversary of the proposed government, whether language can furnish epithets of too much asperity for so shameless and so prostitute, prostitute. an attempt to impose on the citizens of America. 
Um, so look, these other people, they're lying to you about what we've done with the executive. Um, right. I can't even scruple to talk about how awful they're being. You'll understand when you actually see how clear it is um, the case that we're making. Right. <laughs> we keep I'm going to embed all of that in some, some vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then he goes into 68, and I think 68 is going to be something really to talk about with students um, in the fall uh, because it's a presidential election year. Um, and so this is where the, the Publius is outlining sort of the reasoning behind why we have an electoral college. Um, and I think the, um, the second paragraph here I think is, is really good, but um, I actually want to skip to the third paragraph. We can come back to the second one if we want. Um, but uh, this, it was, a, it was also particularly desirable to afford as little opportunity as possible to tumult and disorder. disorder. This evil was not least to be dreaded in the election of a magistrate who was to have so important an agency in the administration of the government as the president of the United States. So what he's referring to there is having this body that exists outside of anybody that's elected for the sole purpose of electing the president of the United States. So it's not directly elected. It's not even elected by state legislatures. It's elected by these, these uh, members of this college that are gathered together for the sole purpose of electing the president. Why do we want to do that? Well, he says here to avoid tumult and disorder. In other words, create a, a, a space between the passions of the people uh, and the uh, partisanship of states to elect in the ideal world, a person who sits above all of that, um, which would be um, uh, the president of the United States. So someone that is, that is going to be our executive and entrusted with um, these particular um, advanced powers, which if done correctly, will then ally all the concerns that you people who are worried about this executive have um, of someone who's going to overreach and become a tyrant. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. It, so, so you would say is it's rather than assigning a power to people who are, have some kind of permanent position, it is creating the people for this power that exists and solely right. for that purpose, which is a yeah. really amazing concept. That's still thinking out of the box in a way. Yeah. 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 And it's this idea and this happens throughout is sort of refining the, the, the object, one of the, the, the mechanization, the, the mechanical devices in the constitution you can call it mechanical. It's this idea that we're refining, we're hearing the people and then we're refining out whatever their passionate topics are to create what's going to be reasonable, but still connected back to that passion. So it's that balancing of reason and passion that they're continually coming back to. And this, this refinement is what gets government to a place where it can actually think and reason, even though it's dependent upon this, this tumultuous, uh, passionate, faction-ridden uh, people that we all are. Um, how is it that we balance those things out? Well, this is one of the, the ways that they are arguing that that can be done. Um, and so, um, again, we have a, a current events article that touches on this. Um, and I, I think coming back to this article, this, this fall will be really helpful for students. We're also, another shameless plug, uh, producing homework help videos, um, one of which deals with the Electoral College. It touches a little bit on this paper, um, but, but really talking about what the structure of the Electoral College is, what the argument for the framers um, having the college uh, was, why it is that they framed it the way that they did, why they saw those things as important. Um, and I think that opens up a really great opportunity to debate with your students um, what the merits of the Electoral College, whether or not it's out of date or whether or not it needs to be revised or whether or not it continues to perform um, the function that it was originally intended to, which is um, trying to balance out all the varied interests in the United States um, in order to make sure that um, whoever is representing the people um, is as broadly elected as possible. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts, Rachel or Gary? No, I think that makes sense. Did you want to? Did you want to move on to Federalist? Because we still have one more Federalist paper. We have Federalist do, Seventy, yeah. and then no, maybe yeah. maybe the Brutus would be fun to touch on too, because the anti-Federalists sure. don't get nearly as much love. So I'll just touch briefly on sixty-nine and seventy, just to say um, it's more walking through exactly how it is that this is the the, the executive is being set up. Um, and so in 69, it's talking about the justification for why, who, who, wh, wh, the, the method for who, wh, the, I can't speak. I'll take a minute. We're all overwhelmed. I completely right. understand. Yeah, I, that's why lot. I was, I was yeah. struck silent as well. It's just. <laughs> so I think for me, what, what, toward the latter, the latter part of the, the, um, the Federalist Papers really, again, with thinking about the nature of the executive and, and throwing it back to, 
what is the what is human nature like how do you yeah. have an an individual representative and how do you constrain that power and again thinking about modern current times there are a lot of people who are disagreeing in lots of ways about lots of things related to our executive right now right so what is the this um uh where is it um so the president would be an officer unlike the great britain who has this hereditary prince but would be amenable to personal punishments and grace um the uh, the person the other is sacred and inviolable right so even in that first sentence is is the executive amenable to personal punishment and disgrace is that a thing that is um, that that any any uh any executive is amenable to, and should they be? I mean, they're they're embedded in these descriptions of the nature of the of the executive as they were describing it. There are questions of values and culture that I think are really interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like even down at the bottom, the one has no particular no particle of spiritual jurisdiction. Is that true? Um, is that has that been the case in American history? I mean, in one of our previous webinars, we referred to um, the, the fireside chats of Roosevelt, where he very clearly calls people's attention to the fact that it's um, the fact that it's Easter time. And he, he speaks eloquently about the story of Easter and the, the relationship with God that the American people have. And so I, I think what's, again, situating these particular discussions of the executive in the time and then seeing how it's evolved over time as our culture has evolved or not evolved um, to think about how the nature of, um, how the, nature of the, the executive shifts and how our expectations of what the executive does shifts over time. Yeah, absolutely. And and what a task he has at this point, right? The The appeal to human nature isn't, purely a persuasive way of saying something but to say no what we're building here if it works needs to go in perpetuity considering human nature and so you know we don't know what 200 years from now is going to look like but you know you like to wonder how far ahead was he thinking in terms of what is it about human nature what can we rely on happening and then how do we build these systems in a way to deal with whomever is coming next because there's there's the values, but then there are these permanent things, right? There are these these eternal principles and and virtues and things that should continue along into the future. So not talking about human nature just to convince you to think, you know, to not think a certain way, but to to consider his argument, but also to think, no, we have to consider eternally what is happening for this, which is a, a, a huge task to do. Yeah. No, absolutely. And in 69 and 70, that's why they're having the conversations that they're having. So what powers do they have? Why is it a single executive? Partly because a single executive can be called out. Um, and then in 70, talking about what powers we're now giving them, how much energy are we giving the executive? Um, I think both of those things get at that eternal question of if this is going to go on in perpetuity, what's it going to look like? Um, and I think it's interesting too, um, Rachel, you touched on this, but considering how this pl has played out now, because the the president does now, the singular executive plays an interesting role in that they become or have been in the past, particularly starting with um, FDR, sort of the, 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 the cultural beacon for the nation, right? And so there's someone that, that comforts us in, in challenging times. Um, and, you know, I think immediately too of um, uh, FDR's fireside chats, also um, Reagan's speech after the Challenger disaster or, or, or George W. Bush um, after 9-11. I mean, fulfilling this role of, of being... Um, sort of that, uh, sort of the conscience of America. Um, I think recently that's been called into question. I think that's an interesting thing to explore, right? Um, is that something that ought to be a part of that body or is it something that's evolved to be there? Does it necessarily need to be there? I, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting question to ask. Um, same along the lines of what does it mean to have a single executive now that we have these vast executive agencies, right? Um, is it still the single person who's responsible. I think generally speaking, American, the American Republic still looks to the president to be the one who is ultimately responsible for these kinds of situations. So um, for example, um, you saw 
um, I'm just pulling these examples at random, but um, after Hurricane Katrina, the failure of the federal government to adequately respond in that situation, a lot of that fell on the president, right? And the president's inability to manage that executive agency. So I do think that that continues to be a focal point, um, but you could see arguments on the other side too. And that's an interesting question, I think, to explore with students, um, seeing how much the executive still fits into um, the way that they, they're described um, in, these, in these federalist papers. Absolutely. So the la go ahead, Rachel. Oh, absolutely. Just one note about our last, last, the title is wrong. These are the Brutus. So if you look in your handout, you'll see that these lines do refer to Brutus, but the title is incorrect. That's my fault. No problem. So Brutus sneakily coming in um, as Federalist 51. So um, the Anti-Federalists, I think, I just want to touch on them really quickly because they, they do oftentimes get overlooked. Um, but this first Brutus um, stands out to me for a couple reasons. Uh, one, because of how closely it parallels what Hamilton was doing um, in his papers, uh, or it, sort of in setting out the Federalist papers, excuse me. So writing his Publius and Federalist 1. Um, but also it's interesting thinking about the Anti-Federalists because they weren't Whereas the Federalists, there's these 85 set of papers that are written by three people and they have a plan. The Anti-Federalists did not. Uh, so Brutus how, is one how of How un-Federalist of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's also interesting to say that they didn't call themselves Anti-Federalists. In fact, they would have thought that they were the real Federalists, right. and that the Federalists were Anti-Federalists and that they wanted a national union, right. uh, which gets really confusing. But, uh, but, but the Anti-Federalists are what they were called by, by their detractors, right? Um, and so Brutus won. Um, Brutus is, is one of the, Brutus and Federal Farmer are the two anti-federalists that I think that Publius took most seriously. Um, and so here he lays out um, a, a lot of his arguments um, for what it's worth. A lot of people think Brutus won was actually Melanchthon Smith, who was a, um, a, a delegate to the ratification convention in New York. Um, so this is someone that's very much a player and not just someone writing on the sidelines another op-ed. Um, but what I think is interesting um, is in that uh, in that first paragraph, he's doing he's doing what Hamilton was doing, right? And, and Publius was doing. He says, when the public is called to investigate and decide upon a question in which not only the present members of the community are deeply interested, but upon the happiness and misery of generations yet unborn is in, in great measure suspended, the benevolent mind cannot help feeling itself uh, peculiar interest in the result. That's so right? great. That's so great. So, hey, this is a big thing we're undertaking here. So it's on us to be serious about looking at this and, and seriously addressing it. Yeah, and again, um, looking forward to this future that, you know, this is for not just us, but for people who yet to, generations yet from now is a, almost a big responsibility. And, yeah. You know, almost 250 years in the future, talking about it through a technology that would not even right. be conceivable. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and the other thing, I think the other moment I love, if you go to the next slide here, um, it says that, um, I think in the middle of that paragraph, let's make sure it's here. Um, it says, you may face, is uh, if the constitution offered to your acceptance be a wise one calculated to preserve the invaluable blessings of liberty to secure the inestimable rights of mankind and promote ha human happiness, then if you accept it, you will lay a lasting foundation of happiness for millions yet unborn. Generations to come will rise up and call you blessed. You may rejoice in the prospects of this vast extended continent becoming filled with free men who will assert dignity, assert the dignity of human nature, right? He's really laying it on thick. And then if we keep going, uh, he then says, uh, but there's some problems. And then he goes through those problems, right? And he's, and I think one of the reasons that, that they took Brutus so seriously is that he takes their project seriously. And he says, look, I understand what you guys are doing. I'm not rejecting it outright. I'm calling you out on your own terms, what's wrong with this system, right? And so saying like, you're saying that it's gonna stay, you know, now become a consolidated republic, but here's why it's going to. I you're saying that the people yeah. are still gonna have a voice, but this is why it's not going to which is different than the approach that others took, uh, particularly those who are calling for a, a Bill of Rights, for example, um, in, in, in all the Bill just does, um, but, but calling it out for like, hey, this system, it's great what you're trying to do, but what you're trying to do isn't gonna work, um, which I think is interesting. Yeah. There's that, that this sentence, um, the, the but remember sentence in the middle of the paragraph, but remember, yep. when the people once part with power, they can seldom or never resume it again, but by force. Many instances can be produced in which the people have voluntarily increased the power of the rulers, but few, if any, in which the rulers have willingly abridged their authority. 
This is sufficient reason to induce you to be careful in the first instance how you deposit the powers of government. And I think, again, thinking about the current crisis and thinking about the calls to action for governments to act for us to, you know, turn over certain um, rights and privileges that we have, you know, what are the risks there? And can we, will we be able to, will anyone be able to abridge the authority in the future um, if it becomes, if it becomes something that, that is oppressive? And I think that that's, again, those interesting questions about the nature of governance that, that come up in times of crisis. And a really interesting model that you can be on an opposing side to an argument, but still evoke the the stakes being saying the stakes are high. We're not disagreeing the stakes are high on this. And also not disagreeing that there's the need to contemplate the relationship of people and government and one that governs itself, as you said earlier. So like you can have the same things that are important and even similar arguments and still see it completely different. You want to accomplish things. It's not that you just don't want your your plan to work. It's that hold on, we value these things, but also... <laughs> but we see different dangers, right? And yeah, exactly. I, fundamentally, it's about seeing different dangers. Right. And having think, a, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's why, um, and I, I appreciate everyone walking through the Federalist Papers with me, or at least this selection um, of them, because I think that's the opportunity we have those students right now. It's just, it's not to disagree with or even comment on on the the positive or negative policies that are happening uh, and or or anything negative or anything that's going on, but it's it's a way of taking a step back, looking at the stakes that are taking place, and saying, hey, let's let's evaluate this. And in the Federalist Papers provide a great lens to get to some of those very foundational arguments that are at, operating at the root of our government um, and how it is that it functions, um, and help us to return sort of those fundamental questions um, that we can explore with our students, um, and especially now that we have um, so many examples right before us. Right. So. Well, I want to offer a huge thank you to Kirk because he yeah. put all of this together for us, and it was it was a great run, um, jaunt, journey, walk, meander through the through the Federalist Papers, um, and his team did a did a wonderful job putting them together with those current events resources. Um, and we have more of this coming. So if you like what you're seeing and and you want to be a part of our community, we encourage you to reach out. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube. We do the 10th period webinars um, every other week. Uh, we also have our new web series for students. That's twice a week. Um, and we are launching some new uh, homework help videos. So we have about 40 of those already in the can, but we have, we have five more coming up this semester, four or five more coming up this semester. So subscribe and you'll get, you'll get a chance to, to read, um, to, to engage with all that content um, from BRI. Yeah, and we greatly appreciate everything that everyone is, that you all are doing facing sort of this new reality as we all are of uh, trying to continue education through these really um, challenging and unprecedented times. And um, anything we can do to support you in that endeavor, um, let us know any topics you want us to cover, any things you want us to explore, materials that we can work on, um, helping to, to put out to support um, your work in the classroom. We're, we're, we're here for that purpose. So please reach out and let us know. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank you for this and for everybody else watching too. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, it is no lie to say I'm actually inspired to read these a little bit more. And I'm thinking, do I start at the, at, at the top? <laughs> and I realize you know, it does have a lot of really good materials on it. I'm going to, I might go there first. <laughs> I'm going to say. There you go. So I'm definitely, and I, and I it, it's good stuff. It is. And all of the resources are going to be linked not only in the chat, but also in the, uh, the, the description. And then they'll also be on our 10th period webinar website. So if you go to www.mybri.org slash 10th period, you'll be able to find all the resources there as well and share them around. Great. Absolutely. Well, well thanks, thank you Kirk. both so much for joining me. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll talk to everyone again soon. Yeah. Take okay. care thanks of yourselves so and those you love. Bye. Yeah, take care. Bye. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome to another episode of